start. Welcome uh, everyone, one and all, to um, the annual Royal Institute of Philosophy and Institute of Physics lecture on the philosophy of science at the University of York. My name is Tom McLeish um, and I'm a professor of natural philosophy, but my department is the Department of Physics. I'm a physicist and I think that uh, says for me what I'd like to say, uh, start off saying today I'm a physicist um, but I'm one of the physicists, and there are more of us than you might think or fear, that know that we do philosophy anyway, or that we certainly need philosophy to do our science and understand what our science means, and to work out the answers to questions. Um, we have, and are very pleased to have, at the University of York, and had for some time, a joint physics and philosophy undergraduate course. And Dr. Mary Lane, who I'll introduce in just a minute, and, and I are delighted that for the last couple of years, we've also had a joint PhD program. It's not very large yet, um, but um, we're enjoying working um, with the cohort uh, very much in, in any case. Um, so I'm looking forward to tonight very much, um, but it's, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, philosopher of science, Dr. Mary Lane. Mary. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, really nice to, to be here. So um, I'm a professor in the philosophy department at York, uh, working on philosophy of maths and science. And um, it's been a great pleasure over the years since I came to York to be able to welcome every year, uh, or most years, sometimes like Glastonbury, we go fellow. Uh, but most years we have uh, James Ladyman coming in to, to visit us. So uh, James is a professor at the University of Bristol. And uh, James is um, an alumnus of the Department of Philosophy at York. He did his degree in maths and philosophy back in the day. Um, and he's an honorary visiting professor in the department. And on an annual basis, we invite him back to the department to support philosophy of physics in the department and, and host and run the um, annual philosophy of physics event of which this is one. So we missed it last year. Um, we kind of hoped that we'd be able to do it face to face this year. Uh, but as it is, we've not quite made it yet. Um, but the way we normally run it is James introduces, he invites and introduces the speaker. Um, and uh, we have an exciting and interesting talk, which I'm looking forward to. And then James gives a little commentary and then we hand things over to questions. So I'm going to hand over now to, to James to introduce our speaker and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Yes, I'm very pleased to be back with you online. I am honoured to have a degree from the University of York and it was very privileged to be taught by Tony Sudbury about the philosophy of physics. And um, from York, I went to King's College London, partly on his recommendation where Michael Redhead had shortly, um, he'd previously just left that department, but he'd really established philosophy of physics in the UK. And he took, he, he, took, uh, he, he then went to Cambridge and um, nobody ever looked back. And Alex is uh, very much in the tradition that, that Michael um, helped create uh, in philosophy of physics in Britain. He did his undergraduate studies, uh, sorry, his PhD at, um, at King's College London. Uh, and he is now back there, having, having briefly been a colleague of mine at the University of Bristol. So it's my very great pleasure to ask him to give this talk. We have Previously in this series had his PhD supervisor, Dr. Uh, Professor Eleanor Knox, who's also at King's, and he's worked with her and independently on the topic of, of reduction in physics and um, done very important work in that regard. And today's lecture is about, is, is titled with a very general question, which I think many of us are interested in. How do the special sciences emerge from physics? Over to you, Alex. Very much looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm incredibly honoured to be here. I I I mean that really genuine genuinely. I feel like I'm much too um, junior in the field to give such a, a excitingly uh, uh, um, established title title talk. Royal Institute of Philosophy a, um, annual lecture, but hopefully I'm going to kind of excite you and engage you and interest you in everything that's going on in sort of thinking about how different sciences relate to each other and you can go and read the kind of more established voices afterwards. Um, this talk has a really kind of grand title. Can you all see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so this talk is provocatively titled 
how do the special sciences emerge from physics? And I want to kind of sketch out some of the philosophical terrain kind of briefly around this and then zero in or focus on a particular way in which this debate has played out in a particular kind of niche or corner in the philosophy literature and then say some kind of comments about how I think this generalizes to uh, thinking about the relationship between the sciences more generally. So hopefully I can just sort of give you a flavor of what's going on in the debate and then we can come back afterwards and in the discussion we can sort of engage with the question whether or not my kind of claim generalization in fact holds. Okay so saying that again in other ways I want to raise some questions about the structure of the world. These are metaphysical questions. It's how does the world fit together? Do we start with atoms and everything comes from there? Do we start with a fundamental physics? If when God was making the world, did he set down the fundamental physical stuff and everything else followed? That's one way of kind of thinking about this really broad metaphysical question. But I want to do what has sometimes been called naturalized metaphysics. So it's taking this kind of broad question, which I think a lot of people have puzzled over for a long time, and saying, how can we use science to engage, to answer this kind of question? So questions about the structure of the world, but outlining a methodology for using science to answer such questions. And what I'm going to say, what the kind of, to give away the punchline, what I'm going to be doing is saying that the kind of standard way in which people have done this in philosophy, where they say, well, what we need to do is we need to start with like the fundamental theory of physics and derive chemistry and go from there and derive biology, etc. I'm going to say that that's a bit too simplistic, that that's kind of lacking nuance. And that what, in fact, if we want to use science to answer a question, is we need to get much more into the kind of the details of each particular model of the world and show how all the models are interconnected in a really complex way. But if we do this in that sufficiently nuanced way, I'm going to say we can end up still concluding with something like reductionism as our answer. So the questions of interest, the questions of reduction and emergence, they're about the levels of reality. And the question is how the theories of large or medium sized objects relate to theories that describe the micro world. OK, so here's a picture of the levels of reality. This is the kind of old fashioned simplified picture, but I think that there's just to give you a kind of intuitive grasp of what we're getting at. We've got at the bottom level, we've got something like quantum field theory, and then we move up and we get these kind of lattices of particles that make up more complex objects. And then we get to the kind of everyday macro objects that we that we think about in a kind of everyday level. And the question is, how do these relate to each other? Can we understand or explain all the properties of this high level stuff, all the properties of our everyday objects from these theories of fundamental physics? OK, so now that was one motivation. One motivation was, was we want to understand what the world is like. We want to engage with the metaphysics of the world and understand and describe the world in the kind of general terms. Second motivation, maybe more narrow, maybe less, less exciting to some people, is that there's a debate in the philosophy literature. And I'm going to contribute to that debate in a particular way. I'm going to bring out a particular contribution um, that I think is important to that debate. And so the debate is between what might be called reductionists and anti-reductionists. So reductionists are the people who want to reduce everything. They believe something like everything depends on or reduces to or can be explained by lower level stuff. Most fundamental physical stuff can kind of, in some sense, explain everything. The anti-reductionists, they deny that. They say, there are some things that cannot be explained. There are some phenomena that fundamental physics just doesn't have the resources to explain. So I'm gonna present the case for reductionism. And I'm gonna stress as part of that, the main thing that I think reductionism can do which is reduction can allow, account for the stability and autonomy of non-fundamental science. And I'll say what that is in a second, okay. So before I get to that, just like broadly, why might one doubt reductionism? Okay, so there are two sorts of anti-reductionists. 
I mean, you know, anytime anyone says something like that, I'm sure all the philosophers are thinking, well, I can think of a third sort. But anyway, for now, let's go with there are two sorts of anti reductionists. There are those who are motivated by phenomenal consciousness and spirituality and God. They say fundamental physics can't account for all there is because fundamental physics can't account for what it's like to perceive the world as I do as a conscious being, or they can't account for the ethical facts in the world, or they can't account for the existence of ghosts or whatever. I'm not going to talk about that, that group of anti-reductionists. The second set of anti-reductionists, who I am aiming to um, at least query some of their arguments, are those who just say, Look at the world around us and look at the way in which science models the world. It's just so complex. And there is so much stability in the, in the higher level world. The relation, my, like my table and my desk and my computer and all of these are really stable higher level objects. That there's something really missing if we try and say fundamental physics can explain all that there is that that's just not how the world works, it's not how science works, so it's wrong. It's that group of people who I'm seeking to address with these arguments. So I seek to address the latter group. A significant piece of evidence in their favor, a significant reason that one should, or at least why many people think that one should reject reductionism, is what we can call methodological autonomy. We look at the methodology of science, how science is in fact done, and we see that there's a kind of free floating nature and autonomy of non fundamental sciences. So I'm sure there are some cell biologists who know lots about the theory of quarks, the theory of the sub proton and sub neutron particles, those, those theories of the particles that exist inside the particles that exist inside the atomic nucleus. There are some cell biologists who know about those things, but they don't need to. One can be the best cell biologist in the world and not know about that stuff. And so there's this kind of puzzle if you say that fundamental physics can explain all that there is. Why would you think that if you think, if you know that cell biologists don't need that kind of stuff? So there's this kind of puzzle about how is it that the non-fundamental sciences can be methodologically autonomous, that they can free float in this particular way if everything depends on fundamental physics. So that's one, one data point that I want to address is, where does a methodological autonomy of the special sciences come from? And a second is the kind of metaphysical autonomy. And I'm using this in a really specific sense. And I'm going to, there's a famous philosopher called Jerry Fodor who describes what I take to be something like metaphysical autonomy in the following way. He says, damn near everything we know about the world suggests that unimaginably complicated toings and froings of bits and pieces at the extreme micro level manage somehow to converge on stable macro level properties. So this isn't just about the methodology of science, it's about the way the world is itself. If you think about what's going on at side at the micro level inside my table, you can think about that as unimaginably complicated toings and froings of all the particles. We think about the air in the room that I'm in, unfortunately not the same room that you're in, but in all of the, all of the air and all of the different rooms that we're in, has these particles buzzing about in a blooming confusion, right? So how does that converge on the stable macro level properties that we have, like the pressure and the volume and the temperature of the air around us, for example? So Fodor says the somehow really is entirely mysterious. How the micro level manages to converge on the stable macro level properties, he says, is entirely mysterious. Then he goes on to say, why is there anything except physics? Why are there non-fundamental sciences? Why are there chemistry and biology, etc.? He says, I admit that I don't know why. I don't even know how to think about why. So what I'm going to do in this talk is give a really small case study from a little bit of physics that should help you give an idea of how to think about why extremely complicated micro level toings and throwings converge on stable macro level properties. 
And the hope is that this will give an account of how we get methodological autonomy and how we get metaphysical autonomy. We should give you an explanation or an account for how we end up with the kind of motivations for anti-reduction. So a kind of reductionist account, a reductionist explaining away of the motivations for anti-reduction. Okay, challenges to account for the autonomy from the bottom up. I'll take up a case study discussed in the philosophy of physics literature. I'll discuss how anti-reductionist claims about this example might be undermined. And that should give us grounds. And then I won't say too much about this, but I'd love to discuss this more in the discussion bit give us grounds for more general optimisms about, about the prospects of reduction. Okay, good. So a little bit of physics. I hope everyone's still with me. Why is steel resistant to breaking? Okay, let's be a little bit more precise. Why did it take such a huge stress to permanently deform steel? And apologize, apologies for, for, for on two counts for what's coming next. Some people might find it unbelievably simplified and terrible because I'm not giving the all the details of the physical models involved and some people might find it complicated and it goes too far so I'm, I'm going to try and try and please both counts but apologies if, if, I, if I fail to get the right balance okay so if one zooms down to the microscopic structure of steel and you look at the bonds which form the lattice and you think what happens if I if I've got a steel bar in front of me, or I've got a train track in front of me, and I hit it with a hammer, and I hit it really hard with a hammer, and it just stays exactly the same. It might ring for a little bit, it might vibrate for a bit, but it doesn't shatter, it doesn't break. So why is steel so resistant to that kind of deformation, that kind of breaking? If you look down at all the bonds holding together, all the atoms, it feels like, it looks like, the reductionist kind of taking the microstructure and, 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 and zooming out should tell you that it should shatter, it should break much more easily than it does. So this was an historic puzzle, and the solution involves introducing this concept called dis dislocations, this, this kind of intermediate level structure called dislocations, and I'll say what that is. Okay, cool. So there's this really nice... Um, diagram from, uh, um, uh, from, a, from a textbook about dislocations, uh, and it kind of shows all the different levels of analysis that one needs to introduce in order to explain why it is that steel is, as it says there, high strength, high, resist, high wear resistant rail steel. So how do you get to that kind of steel? And the answer is, involves thinking not just about, as the reductionist might have presumed, not just about the kind of most basic level lattice and the theory of that and using the theory of that to derive everything else as a reductionist might have hoped. You need to use all these different levels all in, all, in, all in between. So you've got the atomic structure and then you've got this microstructure, which there are all these different things called dislocation. And then you've got various other different levels of structure. So what is dislocation? Um, dislocations, if you think about the atomic lattice, they're just holes in the lattice. They're just little um, abnormalities in the lattice. Now, how does dislocation solve the puzzle? It turns out that if there are abnormalities in the lattice, these things called dislocations, and if they can move about. So this hole, if we see, think of this hole in the lattice moving about when we hit our piece of steel with our hammer, then they can absorb some of the energy from, from that hammer blow. And so they can prevent the whole structure, the whole lattice shattering and falling apart because they absorb some of the energy from the hammer blow. And so if we think there are enough of this uh, uh, low level but not base level structures, enough of these abnormalities, and in fact you can make them in steel by uh, uh, sort of stretching out thick sheets of steel and then bending them over and then hammering them together, and that's how they make steel particularly um, wear resistant and shatter resistant. 
one can understand these dislocations as being key to understanding, key to solving this problem of how it is that steel is so resistant to deformation. Okay. So one can understand what's going on by modeling the dislocations of movable structures, which can be shifted across the lattice. They encounter resistance and shifting them thus absorbs energy. So the steel won't permanently deform while they can move and absorb the energy. Okay. There's lots, lots more to say about dislocation, but for now I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. So, the objection to reductionism that's expressed in detail in the philosophy literature that is, is if you want to compare theories in the traditional reductionist sense, you idealize away structures at intermediate scales. You start with this kind of base theory, the atomic lattice, you try and derive these high level macroscopic phenomenological properties of the steel, and you abstract away from this intermediate structure and you say, okay, well, steel doesn't have the properties I would have expected to have if I just took the lattice. And so therefore something like reductionism doesn't work in this case. Reductionism, traditional reductionism gets it wrong. There's no tractable story of the whole lattice, including its dislocation. So Bob Batterman says, I suggest using the particular reference to this particular example that he develops in some detail, I suggest that much philosophical confusion about reduction, emergence, atomism, anti-realism follows from the absolute choice between bottom-up and top-down modeling that the tyranny of scales apparently forces upon. Recent work in homogenization theory, I'll say what it is in a moment, is beginning to provide much more subtle descriptive and modeling strategies. This new work, and here's the kind of the punchline of Batterman's, uh, a significant part of his philosophical project is to say, it calls into question the stark dichotomy between the do it in a completely bottom up fashion folk and those who insist that top down methods are to be preferred. So what he says there is that the subtleties of how it is that we have to model the physical world preclude us from being reductionists where we say, do it in a bottom-up fashion. Start with fundamental physics and explain everything else. He said, that just doesn't work. That's the wrong way to go. So homogenization theory it looks at how it is that scales of one meter to say um, a millimeter the steel girder appears to be almost completely homogeneous. It's kind of smooth. While we know, of course, that at microscopic scales, the girder is composed of discrete atoms. We need something like homogenization. We need this kind of more subtle, more, in, more nuanced account, which tells us how our different scales relate to each other. Reductions leave out the intermediate scales and thus fail to explain high level goings on. Okay. Now let's pause, take a kind of meta account of what's going on. If you think about it, scientific models are something like maps. They're maps that we can use to model to describe the world. And maps always leave out detail. There's this really nice um, famous Borges story about the map, which is, includes all detail and is in exactly the size of the world. Because maps, if they, they, they have a particular purpose in mind, they, for example, want to describe the topology of the streets, they want to tell you how to get from A to B, or they want to include the distances as well, or they want to include some landmarks, they include some amount of detail, but not all the detail. And that's how scientific models work in general. They always idealize, they always leave out detail. So any accurate model of a real world system will need to make some idealization. All models involve some kind of assumption that the model itself is located in a homogeneous environment. And that's why reduction, that's why this traditional approach to reduction goes wrong. Because what it does is it takes the assumptions tailored to a particular set of local conditions and it zooms them out, it drags them out and applies them in a much more broader setting. And that doesn't work, it gets it wrong. If you take a good model of an atomic lattice and you think about the bonds between the atoms and you scale them up and you apply that to a steel to a, to a steel bar as a whole, you will mischaracterize it, you'll get it wrong. And the reason you'll get it wrong is 
because the model was designed for a particular environment and you've taken it out of that. You, you've taken your, your bottom-up reasoning standardly, takes the idealizations used to describe your map of your little part of the world and tries to apply it to an area that it wasn't designed for. So reduction standardly involves extending the scope of a model to a broader environment. And I think what's wrong with traditional reduction, reductionist approaches is that they don't correct for this. They don't say, I've got my local assumptions and I then need to, I can then kind of expand them and describe the whole world without correcting, without taking into account the peculiarities and the nuances required. Okay, so a lot of what I'm saying comes from a really great philosopher who writes fairly impenetrable pose, prose called, called, called Mark Wilson. So he says, our core problems properly represent struggles with the representational capacities of mathematics. The tool that naturally provides often seem too stiff to track evolving natural processes ably over long stretches of time or distances. So it's not just a problem that we need to idealize in order to use physical models, but also mathematics limits our kind of representational capacities. And so prevents us from being able to take into account all the details that are relevant when scaling up to higher levels. Okay, we need to be very careful. So one can, some do, Bob Batterman does, for example, take this all as evidence that we should reject, reject reductionism. Now, what I want to say is that we ought not to be so quick and say, therefore, reductionism as this grand metaphysical thesis is out. I think that what we can rather do is we can say, Traditional reductionism, where we take a theory and we derive the next theory and we derive the next theory and so on and so on. That's how, that's not the way to proceed. But we can gain evidence for this broader metaphysical picture of reduction by doing these local reductive explanations. So reduction seem to require just such moves where we kind of take our grand theories and we idealize and we get them all wrong. But that's not what reduction needs. So, so far we've seen what might be called a uh, 27 degrees in London. And my office has no air conditioning, but anyway. Um, so far we've seen what might be called a multi-scale argument against reduction. The case study prompts questions about how any attempt at reducing higher levels to lower levels can succeed. Might not there always be relevant intermediate structure? So the aim for the rest of the talk is to motivate the claim that underlying structures and processes coordinate to allow relative simplicity to emerge. But this requires a different model of reduction. So the thought is that we have this multi-scale model of how steel works, which takes into account ideas from all the different scales. And what we can do in order to gain, like in order to give evidence, in order to um, provide reason to believe in reductionism, is understand how it is that each model, at each level, at each scale works. Why does it work? And if we can explain why it works in the from the bottom up, if we can explain why that model is the right one to describe our system at that scale, then it looks like this kind of grand reductionist project of everything in some sense can be explained by the bottom up, that works. But it's piecemeal and it's, it's very uh, bitter. Okay. So in order to respond to the anti-reductionist, the reductionists can't just rely on these kind of grand theories deriving one from the other, they have to do better. They need to show how lower levels make it such that higher level descriptions are so good. So they may only convince the anti-reductions if they can explain how multi-scale models, despite their relative lack of detail, offer predictions and explanations all the way up. Why are these multi-scale, why is this kind of, this model that involves thinking about steel at all these different scales, why does that work so well? If the reductionists can account for that, it seems like they can undermine this motivation for anti-reduction. Okay. But reduction is much less grand, involves getting into details of any particular case. 
kind of less exciting perhaps. But I think if one's interested in this broader question about how the world fits together, this is what we should be doing. Okay. So we can think about dislocations as autonomous. We can think about them as being a kind of, this being a very, very small case study, which will help us think about how the special sciences gain their autonomy altogether how the kind of micro level toing and throwings converge on macro level stability. Okay, what makes it so that we can explain what's going on in terms of dislocations without thinking about the details of the atomic lattice? So this is a physics question and we can answer it with physics. So we can think about this very specific model of a dislocation and you can think about there being kind of to the left-hand side and the right-hand side could be thought of as half lattices. And there are two forces going on. There's one which wants to kind of each side to pull away from the dislocation and to make its own kind of stable lattice structure away from, so that's kind of making the hole bigger. And there's the other one, which is the atoms around the hole around the dislocation pulling together, okay? So you can think about the restoring force minimizes the dislocation by pulling the atoms back together around the hole, and the elastic force expands the dislocation by pulling each half lattice back into a regular range. So these two forces find an equilibrium. The model allows for the prediction of dislocation size. Dislocation description is stable with respect to changes in other variables. So we get this stability. These atoms can kind of have their own vibrations and they can have their own interactions and we can still add, we can still allow, we can still start to see how we get something like this model where we just think about the dislocation variable and its motion through the atomic lattice. We can abstract away from what the kind of underlying atoms are doing. We can move up a level and think about the dislocation as its own kind of object without keeping track of what every atom is doing. The reason we can do that, that's because the atomic structure gives rise to a kind of stable dislocation size. Okay. So we may determine from these models that the dislocation description is robust. Well, the lattice is fairly well ordered and with an acceptable range of temperatures. So what we can end up doing is we start in a very localized way with a very, particular model of a particular bit of the world, or we can explain why it is that we can get away with knowing the higher level, the next level up. And this is the kind of grand thing I want to be saying is that all the way through the whole picture we have of how all the different theories in the world fits together involve taking one model and using it to explain the applicability and the success of the sort of next model up. Okay, what else about dislocations? Dislocations must be able to move across the lattice. The force required to move dislocation depends on the resistance of the lattice to dislocation glide. There are, dislocations can kind of move laterally along the lattice and they can move between uh, sort of uh, planes. And I'm ignoring the climb between the planes. This can again be calculated. You can end up with an equation. I've got an equation. This is a philosophy of physics talk. We ought to have an equation. We can think about the dislocation moving through a series of potential wells. And we can work out the mathematics of dislocations and we can work out the, the kind of stress required to overcome each barrier. And it turns out to be proportional to D on B, where D is the distance between the planes of the lattice and B is roughly the size of the dislocation. And then it turns out to be a structural feature of different materials, what value they have for this ratio D on B. And ceramics have a very low D on B, which means that it's very, very difficult for dislocations to move through ceramics, which means that if you hit your ceramic jug with a hammer, it will shatter because the dislocations can't dissipate the energy in the way that they can do with the steel. However, dislocations can move much, much more easily through steel. There's an exponential in the equation, which helps us out here. And that means that the dislocations can dissipate the energy much better. 
So here we've got a kind of physical bottom-up explanation for why it is the dislocation model works so well. And then we now can move up and we can make use of this kind of multi-scale model, including dislocations. And then we can include the next level, the next level, and so on. But we can construct this incredibly complex model of this little bit of the world. But we can justify the methodological autonomy. We can justify why it is that one thinking about dislocations, you don't need to keep track of what the atoms are doing by showing how it is that the atoms come together and coordinate and cooperate to make it such that dislocations themselves are just the right level of analysis that we need for certain kind of processes. All we need to do is keep track of the dislocations because the atomic structure makes itself irrelevant for a whole bunch of scientific predictive explanatory purposes. Okay. So, reductionism vindicated. Um, in the context of the case study, we may understand from the bottom up why it is the dislocation variables work so well. Okay, so the one thing to say is this equation I gave you, one can go far more complex than that. You can get much more precise than that. This itself is super idealized. It works only in very special contexts under very special assumptions. But it's instructive to see the kind of thinking that one can appeal to if you want to do uh, naturalistic metaphysics in the way that I think it ought to be done. That is, uh, it's not good enough, I think, to say, here's a big theory, let's derive another big theory in order to really evidence something quite as strong as reductionism, we need to take into account how science in practice works. And science in practice works by making idealizations in all these different contexts. And reductionism stretches those idealizations out to contexts in which they no longer apply. And that leads us astray. But this isn't a full reduction. The purpose was to demonstrate that insofar as reduction is understood more plurally, rather than just in this theory deriving theory way, one may achieve reductions even in the context of interesting intermediate structure. So piecing local reductions together, understanding from the bottom up is painstaking, but not, I claim, impossible. Okay. So I'm coming to wrapping up a bit. And you might think, where are the special sciences? Where did they go? And I set myself two bigger projects for the talk. The title was too, um, was too bold, but I have papers in which I apply this kind of methodology, this kind of idea of how we get the methodological autonomy of the higher level sciences, how we get the metaphysical and methodological autonomy, how it is that objects like um, neurons can send signals and their signals are on or off, notwithstanding that there's a whole bunch of ionic motions which underwrite that on off. So when we say that, when we think about what's going on in neuroscience, we can end up thinking in these very, very simple on-off terms of our signals. But our signals being on-off can be explained from the bottom up. So the autonomy of our kind of neural signals from the underlying ionic motions, I claim, can also be explained. I kind of think about this stuff in terms of chemistry as well. I think there are lots of things to say there. I think that this kind of broad project of saying, Yes, higher level world is methodologically and in a sense metaphysically autonomous, but that can be accounted for and explained by taking into account the details of the underlying processes that are responsible for that methodological and metaphysical autonomy. I think that's an approach which works quite generally and can 
I want to say refute, but that seems a bit too strong, undermine some of the motivations and claims brought by anti-reductionists to bear against reductionism. Okay. At each new level, there's cooperation and interaction to generate the next level of autonomy, the next level of uh, blooming, buzzing, confusion of lower level stuff, giving rise to simple, stable, higher level stuff. The autonomy of the special sciences, how they emerge from fundamental physics is a consequence of these kind of lower level interactions and all the cooperation, cooperation between all the parts. In this case, and more generally, you need interactions and parts to cooperate in the right kind of way. When that occurs, we can abstract from the lower level detail. I can imagine a world perhaps in which there wasn't such higher level stable structure. It wouldn't be a world in which we existed. And so it's a feature of our world because we are a particular kind of higher level stable structure or, 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 or a particular kind of entity that comes out of that high level structure, depending on whether or not, depending on one's metaphysics, but that's another story. Um, okay. I've sketched an approach to reduction, which can provide warrant for reductionism while applying to actual science in all its glorious complexity. Such an approach better corresponds to projects which scientists actually pursue. So I think that one advantage of thinking about reduction in this kind of way is that it's very, very few scientists who are really involved in this kind of deriving one theory from another kind of project. But I take it that a huge amount of scientific activity is involved in this explanation and the kind of the um, detailing of the conditions that a particular model works in, and the conditions in which a particular model fails. And that kind of project, why did this model work here? Why does it fail over there? That I think is part of this piecemeal reduction. The reductive explanation that I'm talking about relies on being able to say what conditions apply, what conditions are required for these particular models to work in the way they do. And I think that's, what we ought to be thinking about when we're trying to answer these questions of reductionism or not. Good. By taking into account the interesting ways in which multi-scale models are used in science, one allows for richer reductionism and a more accurate depiction of the world. Okay. And then to kind of end with a couple of caveats, even reductive explanation of this sort is really hard to achieve. Ultimately, this all depends on detailed demonstrations across many scientific contexts. I think it's empirically sensitive. I think it could turn out that reductionism fails to be true. I'm skeptical of that claim. I think the reductionism seems to me like the kind of metaphysics that we've got good evidence to accept for the kind of reasons that I've been talking about, but it could turn out to be false. And it could turn out to be empirically false because the kind of bottom-up reductive strategy that I've been talking about could just not work. I'm not claiming, but, okay, fine. So that's one thing to say. So it really depends on these demonstrations. There's something else, a subtlety I want to introduce. I'm not claiming, in fact, that we should be able to explain every phenomenon from the bottom up, because I think explanation is a bit more subtle than that. I think that explanation, uh, good explanations are fairly parsimonious, good explanations are kind of understandable, good explanations are the kind of things that humans can get their heads around, and humans can't get their heads around from the basis of atomic theory or let alone quantum field theory, why it is that my table can hold up my debt, my uh, uh, computer in the right kind of way. That's not the kind of thing that our heads could get, that we could get our heads around. So that's just one reason why I don't think that we can explain every phenomenon from the bottom up, but I do think that this kind of cascade of explanations for why the model at each level works so well that's the kind of thing that we can bottom up explain. So we can bottom up explain why any higher level explanation works. That's the claim. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much everyone for concentrating and uh, uh, listening and 
and I, yeah, good. Thank you very much. That's really a great talk, Alex, and um, really clear. So I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, one is Sorry, that- Can I just jump in, James? Alex, yeah. if, you, if you stop showing your slides, I should be able to spotlight James again so that we can see him, I think. Yes. There we are. Carry um, on as you were. Yeah, so a couple of comments. And one, just for the audience who might be a bit disorientated, um, there's a massive debate in philosophy about reduction and emergence. And like lots of debates in philosophy, um, a, a, it, a lot of it is characterized by people arguing about what they mean by reduction and emergence. And um, one, one thing that people often say is, well, what I mean by emergence is just what's incompatible with reduction. So just, you know, if you're confused, don't worry, that's because people use terms in different ways. Alex is here representing a kind of broader program of, of kind of people arguing for both reduction and emergence, right, I think it's fair to say. So in a, in a certain sense of emergence. So when Alex talks about um, the autonomy of the special sciences, that's the kind of emergence we're talking about. And um, I think what I want to draw attention to is the strength of Alex's argument there, because the idea is, right, we're not going to kind of argue why autonomy is really an illusion or something, what we're going to do is explain autonomy in reductionist terms. So it's a very powerful way to respond to that argument against reductionism. Um, now, uh, my remarks are going to be very short. One, one thing I just want to say is that um, Alex is perhaps, in order to be being, being concessive um, to the people who disagree with him, I think uh, um, implicitly um, kind of allowing them to get away with overstating the extent of methodological autonomy of the special sciences. So one thing, you know, sometimes you hear philosophers talking and you kind of think, look, hold on a minute, get, get a grip, right? Nobody in the biology department operates outside of the basic idea of the, the periodic table of the elements, the basic forces, the scientific units that everyone else uses. Likewise for the chemistry department. So um, yes, of course it's true that, um, Molecular biologists can't, you, you can't be a molecular biologist just by knowing physics. I mean, absolutely not. But equally, um, chemists and molecular biologists know some physics, and, um, and certainly they draw upon um, the same sort of store of physical knowledge that everybody else does. Um, so that's, that's just one point. And then um, I think there's, there's part of the story here which, um, which Alex didn't mention because there's only so much that you can you can mention and he said a lot and I would just um, draw attention to which is he started at the very beginning with this idea of how's the world made do we just put together all the atoms and I think the really important thing that we've learned from from the sciences in the 20th century is actually you need a history to make even um, the simplest things uh, the whole point of the really the evolutionary turn in biology is to understand biology in terms of evolutionary history. But uh, even in physics, we, we understand now that the heavy elements require this whole long history of the universe for their production. Um, and so time is a big part of the story and um, a big part of the story, which I'm, I'm sure Alex would talk about if he, if he had more time, is the way that um, the kind of autonomy that he's talking about comes about because of the effective decoupling of processes at different time scales. And lots of modeling of how the big comes from the small depends on, on that, um, that there can be effective dynamics at higher levels, which um, happens at a very different scale to uh, the dynamics at lower levels. So we've, we've kind of learned that um, scale is really in, important in um, our understanding of, of the world and the, the different scientific tools and models that we, we use to do that. So that's it from me. We're going to take a short break and then Mary will be chairing the questions. And I'd just like to thank you all and Tom and Mary and once again, Alex, for a fantastic talk. <laughs>